Welcome. Today I want to take some of the concepts that we've been learning in our advanced advocacy course and I want to apply it to the, uh, to the rubric of teaching. I want to bring you in and to, and to put together some of the concepts that we've talked about about personality and concepts that we're going to discuss about psychology and about rhetoric and I want to bring them in along with storytelling to the process of teaching. And that teaching is somewhat different, uh, but it's really not actually different from anything else that attorneys do. Because if you'll stop and think about it for a moment, whenever we represent a client, whenever we are involved in a discussion with another party, with a judge or with the finder of fact, a decision maker, uh, you know, to use uh, President Bush's words, a decider, whenever we're working with someone like that, what we're doing is educating them on something that they don't know uh, in light of a set of standards and then suggesting to them a resolution based upon the educational process that we've engaged in. Uh, that's a lot of what being an advocate is. It's about teaching and, and I want to approach it with you today from the idea, from the very pure idea that if you know something you almost have to teach it. You're called to teach it, you're called to share it. Um, there was a very famous philosopher. His name was Ibn Gabirol. Uh, he was in Spain, Moorish Spain, and he happened to be of the Jewish faith. So you have a Jewish philosopher writing in the tradition of uh, Neoplatonic uh, in a country that is controlled by an Islamic religion at the time. Why do I share that with you? Uh, it's just a, an incident of history. But uh, his comments about uh, wanting to become more proficient, wanting to have more knowledge, wanting to have more understanding of a subject are spot on. You know, when we're first trying to learn, uh, we, we're quiet and, and we're working on pulling that information in and assimilating it and, and thinking about it. And as we begin to get a little bit better at... Um, at what it is that we're doing, we're not only quiet, but we begin to actively listen to the information that's being presented to us. And eventually, uh, we're able to recall it. We're able to recall it and give it to someone else. And then at some point, we know enough to begin to practice uh, the information that has been given to us, whether it's the law or any other skill or any other block of knowledge. It has a practical application. And in that practical application, we begin to develop our understanding of it. At some point, as we develop this wisdom, it's human nature to want to share it with other folks. And that desire to share, that desire to take what we have learned and to give it to another human being, uh, it's uniquely human, but it's also the core uh, concept behind advocacy instruction. And it's something that we need to talk about so that as we go forward, you're thinking about uh, the skills that you are developing and the knowledge that you are acquiring in light of perhaps at some point in some place, I'm going to provide this information to other human beings. And if we, if we thought about it structurally as we begin this journey or as we get a little bit further down the path on it, understanding the structure before we start to hang the information on it can be very helpful to us. Um, this is important for your development as, um, as students and as potential teachers. And it's important if you want to teach advocacy for certain. If you have a desire at some point uh, to be someone who professes this skill to others, whether it's in a CLE environment, as an adjunct at a law school, or potentially uh, as a member of a faculty somewhere or in a not-for-profit organization, uh, it's important to you that you think about it structurally, that you understand the underpinnings of the, um, of the doctrine behind what makes for effective teaching. And some of that doctrine has been developed by pointy-headed academics in ivory towers who uh, use highfalutin words like taxonomy to explain it, and others of it uh, are pulled from the practice of law and the experiences of life. Even if you've never wanted to teach advocacy, a very interesting thing happens when I begin to think about a subject through the context 
of potentially teaching it to someone else. In order to teach it, theoretically, I have to be able to understand it at a level that is not required if I'm just going to practice it. So going through the drill of thinking about if I were tasked to teach this information to another human being, how would I do it? Going through that thought process, using the structure that I'm going to share with you today will be helpful to you in being better at the skill. And a large part of our advocacy LLM here, from the standpoint of the development of your individual uh, advocacy skills, is this idea of self-assessment, this concept that what we are doing has to be done critically. We have to, to critically look at how we operate, what we do and do not do. And when I use the word critically, I don't mean in a negative tone. I mean that we are looking at it with specificity to try to improve our ability to communicate. And that's sort of what we're about. And of course, if you're not sure whether or not you want to be a teacher, uh, perhaps the discussion today will assist you in thinking, maybe this is something I want to give a try at some point. Uh, so for each of you in the audience, you know, regardless of where you fall on that continuum, there's going to be something out of this block of instruction that will be helpful to you, both in the practice and in the teaching of law to others. Now, this subject of teaching uh, connects to the work that we're doing on personality sorting. Uh, all of you have done the personality sorting at this point. You've gone and you've taken the test. You've identified your own personality. Uh, you've made some comments about personality that we've shared with one another on the discussion boards. And that was good because that was self-reflection. That's helpful. But what's even more helpful is how I began to think about how the different personalities, the different learning modalities, the different ways in which just this group of us view the world, how do they interconnect? Where do they come together in a way that makes it easier to teach? Where do they diverge so that some of you uh, enjoy or are keyed into or tied into a particular type of presentation and others of you are completely bored by it? This view into personality, uh, from my perspective as a, as a law professor and as a and as a practicing lawyer, as a trial lawyer, this concept of personality is important because it's one more way that I can sort people and choose uh, means of presentation so that I can more effectively persuade. So that connection to personality is important to me. It's also important from a storytelling perspective. You know, your personality type might have a great deal to do with whether or not you're interested in details or overarching themes. Uh, the, the parts of the story that you focus on and why you focus on those stories. It's very helpful to me in that way. And um, this idea of teaching uh, has a storytelling component to it. Every class has a beginning, a middle, and an end. If you look at some of the things that I'm doing uh, as I talk to you, there's a structure and a flow. I create the structure because I want you to have certain expectations each and every time we do this. I want those expectations to be met or exceeded. Uh, and I'm mentioning it to you now because I want you to see the structure behind the process because at a more advanced level of learning, we should be thinking about the structure of what's being done and not just the information that's being delivered. And this will get into some of the stuff that we're going to do with rhetoric and with theories of persuasion. And all of it ties into the practice of law. So this idea of being able to teach, of being able to share information, whether it's explaining a legal concept to a client, um, discussing potential uh, practical solutions to a problem, all of it connects back to our ability to marshal information and present it in a way that makes it not only acceptable but understandable and then usable by other human beings. So let's say you've been given the mission to prepare a teaching block of instruction. And one of the things that I'm going to have you do as an assignment, uh, either with this block or in the next block, as I'm recording the lecture today, I literally haven't decided yet at what point I'm going to do it. But I'm going to give you uh, a task. 
and it will, we will identify a particular advocacy skill, and I'm going to ask you to create a, a plan for how you would present that information. Now this preparing to teach uh, checklist that I've got here on the slide uh, will help you an awful lot anytime you've got to get yourself into a position to effectively teach information to another human being. And you always start uh, as you begin to teach by identifying the core concept or concepts that the other side needs to learn to effectively develop their base of knowledge. And I have to begin with the outcome. If you'll think about it for a moment, it's just like trying a case. I try to determine where it is I want to end up, and then I work my way backwards to determine what I have to do to get there. Well, teaching is exactly the same way. I'm identifying the core concept, the core outcome, that when I test the student, they're going to have competency in. And once I've identified that core skill or skills or substantive knowledge, I then choose the means of delivery of that information in a way that's designed to make it most effective, uh, in a way that's designed to resonate with the student, to resonate with students who have different learning styles, who have different types of personalities. And so I try to mix, at the appropriate level, different types of uh, learning modalities, different types of means of presentation to capture the interest of individuals. And if you'll think about the gee whiz nature of the, this online LLM that you're involved in right now, I could deliver every piece of substantive information that we've been sharing to date uh, with a small picture of just my head talking into a web camera. Or I could deliver it <clears throat> talking into a microphone while you watched PowerPoint slide after PowerPoint slide after PowerPoint slide. I could do that. Well, just moving my hand away from my face, just allowing my, my hands to come up in a way that you can see so that the movement is tied to the discussion that we are having. Uh, seeing the visual presentation uh, on, the, on the page, on the screen at the same time that I'm talking. Having the images that I choose for the backgrounds of the presentations tie at some core conceptual level uh, to the concept that I'm talking about. These are all thought out means of the presentation of the core component. Uh, let's go back to that slide, Sam. Let's pull it up big so that everybody can see it. You'll notice I've got the checklist there, and off to the side, I've got an apple. I'm talking about preparing to teach. I don't know about you, and I don't know about children today, but when I was a child, and when my children were children, apple for teacher has a particular meaning, right? The idea of presenting that uh, fresh, ripe piece of fruit uh, has a gift to your teacher and the thanks for the teaching that they're doing is, it's symptomatic of what it means to be a teacher. And so when I was thinking about uh, preparing to teach and what the requirements were for preparing to teach, I thought, well, let's put a picture of the apple on the page. That's an example of using a means to get to the core component. Because what I'm trying to do with that photo of the apple is to trick, um, is to tickle an internal memory, an association that you already have with teaching that is represented by the photograph. Now normally, uh, in a regular class uh, that, that's not at the LLM level, I would not be talking about the picture on the back of the slide. But we're here at an advanced level of learning where we're trying to connect multiple means of presentation for a holistic whole. So this discussion about the photograph fits into the selection of the means and how the selection of the means needs to tie into the core message that we're trying to get to. Now, the core message and the appropriate means of delivery uh, accomplish some other things for me as well. If I pick too many clear fundamental cores that I need to teach in any particular block of instruction, I wind up diluting the message, I wind up confusing the student, uh, and I'm not able to effectively communicate so that they can learn at their individual maximum capacity. I have to think about the structure of the information that I present 
so that it appropriately flows into uh, the individuals that I'm trying to teach. And I'm thinking about this, this structure while at the same time I have students of varying different abilities and experiences. And this is going to be the case for you if you're going to teach uh, in this sort of environment. If you're going to teach professionals in a continuing legal education, in a presentation to the bar, in a presentation to a particular group of folks who are professionals, you are always going to have a group of folks with widely disparate levels of ability and life experiences. If you identify the core message the right way and the means of presentation the right way, you'll be able to touch something in each person regardless of their level of expertise. So for some of you who are listening to this right now, you're thinking, I wish you'd get on with it. You're sort of skipping across the surface. Others of you are going, you know, I never really thought about the fact that the picture in the background connects to the message that's being given. Uh, my hope is that uh, by sharing this with you, we really begin to think about it. Uh, this helps me choose the process of presentation of the information. Uh, when I've identified the core message, I know what means I have available for delivery. I now identify the process of the message that I'm going to, um, to deliver. Let's, uh, let's think about this from an analogy perspective for a moment. And the analogy that I want to use is the direct examination of a witness at trial. Whenever I have a witness at trial that I've got to present, uh, I'm always worried about making them interesting, about getting, making the witness the focus of the presentation, and the jury not losing interest and the jury coming along with us on the journey that we want to take. If I've identified the core messages, you know, the reason that I'm calling this witness to testify, and if I know the means that I could potentially use with this witness, and, and as we think about it, based upon our practices in the law, we know some of them, uh, exhibits, diagrams, demonstrations, they're all available to me, plus the structure of the story of the direct itself, I begin to think about the process of the delivery of the information. Where might I include a diagram, uh, include an exhibit uh, to break the flow? Where might I change the focus of the story of the witness's testimony? When does my voice drop as I ask the question? When do I move on with a raised voice? How do I identify the headlines for each block of questioning that I'm going to ask? All of these concepts of direct examination are, are analogous to, they're very similar to the way in which teachers think about presenting information. At a certain level, lawyers who are in the business of persuading, I'm not talking about lawyers who think deep thoughts, but lawyers who are truly in the business of moving other individuals from one place in their life to another place in their life are engaged in the art of teaching. And so it helps us to think about it. Now, once I've developed the process so that I appropriately understand it and I've thought about how I'm going to deliver the information, then I have to actually deliver it. Now is the point in time where I take the core message that I've identified, the means that I've chosen to use, and the process that I'm going to go through, and I actually do it. And that's literally what I'm doing right now with you. Uh, I sat down and thought about how we're going to do this message. I thought about the emblems that I wanted to use, the symbolism that I was going to include in our block of instruction today. And I began to focus myself. And when I started thinking about it, I knew I just wanted to talk to you about critiquing folks and how you can give feedback to a person in the moment to immediately make them a better advocate. That was one of the core competencies that I needed you to learn today. But in order for you to understand the value of that, I first had to talk with you about this idea of teaching as a whole. So I work on delivering the core of my message. Once I've delivered it, I then have to assess uh, the student's understanding of it. Now at trial, this is much more problematic because I can't stop and ask the jurors, hey man, did you get that? Uh, that doesn't work. I might have someone watching jurors 
to look for their facial expressions, verbal tics, to see whether or not they're writing something down on their pads or in their notes. Uh, but I don't really know. And it's why I like jurisdictions that allow uh, jurors to ask questions, because that's a way for me to assess, at least at some level, their understanding of the case. But I've got to assess understanding in a teaching environment. And the way that I assess understanding in a teaching environment depends upon the particular skills or substance that I'm teaching. One way to assess is through tests. We've all, we all understand test assessment. But test assessment is as much about the ranking of knowledge of a group of people relative to one another as much as it is truly assessing the understanding of the information. When we're teaching advocacy, we get to take our need to assess the understanding and connect it to uh, our ability to provide feedback uh, and then to have the person do it again. And in the last three bullets on the slide here, uh, assessing understanding, providing feedback, and what I like to call rinse, lather, and repeat is the core component of teaching a skill. Because I am in that moment showing them what to do having them do it, giving them feedback, and then immediately having them do it again. It's, it's as much at some level, teaching any skill is as much about mentoring and coaching the person who is doing it as it is about providing the substantive knowledge of how to do it. And that's one of the things about teaching advocacy uh, that is unique and, and that truthfully makes it so doggone enjoyable is that I get to create this connection with an, a human being to impart this information. I get to see them do it, and then I get to immediately provide them with a way to be even better at this thing that I've taught them. And along the way, I get to learn something as well. Each and every single time I teach a student, each and every time I teach a class, I present a CLE, or I do this sort of thing, I apply this structure to the presentation of information, it's actually a very selfish endeavor because at some point I'm going to get something out of it that I can't get any other way. It's one of the things that makes um, teaching so fulfilling, so enjoyable, uh, so addictive, really. And I, I, I've got an analogy that a good buddy uh, shared with me when we were teaching together years ago. Uh, and we were both trial lawyers. We'd both been prosecutors and, and criminal defense lawyers. He turned to me one day and he says, Charlie, you know what, teaching... Uh, is like methadone uh, for trial lawyers. You got all of the high that you get from heroin from having a client and being at trial, but you don't get any of the nasty side effects. And there's a lot of truth to that. There is a, there is a personal joy that comes from this that energizes you that uh, you don't get in many other ways. And my guess is, is that some of you are actually in this LLM course because you, you've experienced that at some point and you want it again. Uh, and again, and again, and again, and you want to find a way to make yourself better at it and find a way to long-term allow yourself uh, to engage in this uh, at a higher level. And that's, that's part of what, quite frankly, I hope to do with you um, this semester. Uh, Stan, let's pull up the big slide so we can take a look at it. Uh, this graphic right here, and I'm going to talk about it for a few moments. We're just going to leave it up here on the screen because I want you to see it and really sort of um, soak it in. Is is a is a visual representation of a thing in teaching uh, circles that is called Bloom's Taxonomy. And what it is, is a, it's how human beings develop knowledge. And you'll notice at the base of the pyramid, we sort of start with a, uh, we take knowledge in through a variety of sources. And as we take the knowledge in, we really don't even know what the knowledge means, at least initially. We're just sort of uh, passively receiving the information. Uh, we passively, we take it in, maybe we write it down, maybe we're reading it, maybe we're reading it and writing it down. Some of you may even take notes as you watch these lectures because it helps you with the recording of the knowledge. What's interesting though is that the knowledge uh, eventually uh, turns to the need to comprehend what it is that we have learned. And when we begin to deal in comprehension, we're not only thinking about the knowledge that we've received, but we're now trying to understand it, uh, translate it into our own experiences, apply it to, to the knowledge that we already have uh, received and internalized, 
and kind of sort it out so that we know what it means, at least at this point in time, and what we might potentially do with it. Once I've worked through the baseline of having acquired the knowledge, and once I begin to comprehend what it means, I'm now ready to start to apply it. I take this knowledge and I apply it to a set of circumstances. And initially, when I start to apply this knowledge that I've received, I'm not very good at it. I know, um, I know that I need to use it. I'm going to apply it. Uh, and this is an experimental phase where I'm trying to find the design or the structure that will let me be most effective in the comprehension and the application of this knowledge that I've acquired. And at some point, I begin to analyze um, my application of the knowledge and my comprehension of the knowledge. And I go back and check and say, well, do I really know what I thought I knew? Uh, did what I learned in theory work in practice? How might I restructure what I've learned in theory so that I can more effectively use it in the future? And once I reach that, uh, that fourth point, in Bloom's taxonomy of learning, once I begin to analyze and to identify patterns uh, and, to, and to see, truly see, Stan, why don't we come on back out so that I can see my students again. Thank you, bud. Once I can begin to truly see the connections between what it is that I've learned, I'm now ready to begin to share this information with others or I'm ready to embark on a deeper journey of discovery so that I can develop even a deeper knowledge base and a deeper comprehension and additional ways to apply it. So it's in this analysis point of learning that we turn to other ways to deal with the information. Your presence in the LLM, uh, to some extent, is because you have reached a level of knowledge or understanding or at least think you have, about a particular subject, and you want more. You want to understand it at a deeper level. You want to be able to work with it uh, to discover new ideas and to, and to perhaps give birth to something that didn't exist before. And that's really where we get into the synthesis of learning. Now I've taken my analysis, I've taken these concepts that I've learned before, and I'm making stuff that did not exist, at least not within the universe uh, that I'm in. And this idea of synthesis is one of the reasons that multiple research and development groups, uh, places in different uh, locations, can be moving or trending towards uh, a series of discoveries or reinvigoration of concepts or ideas independent from each other, but often in the same time frame because they all come from an environment that is dealing with the same sets of issues, that has the same knowledge base, uh, opportunities to comprehend and apply, and analysis applied. It's a, it's a fascinating thing, but once I get to synthesis, I'm now at the level of evaluation. And when I'm evaluating something that I've learned, um, I'm thinking about it a different way. Let me give you a classic example, again from advocacy instruction. Uh, you learn how to perform cross-examination. When, when you are initially taught how to cross-examine a witness, you learn things like uh, open-ended, uh, excuse me, closed leading questions, maybe the use of a tagline such as isn't that correct or not. You're probably told don't ask the last ultimate question. Uh, you're given a few guideposts that you're supposed to apply. So you internalize that knowledge. You, you, you hear it, but you don't know what the heck it means. So then you begin to try to comprehend how you're supposed to apply the knowledge. Then you go out and you start to cross-examine witnesses. And you discover that some of the stuff that you've been taught is just utter bullshit. It does not work in the way in which your knowledge base that you have been given and the comprehension that you've acquired of that knowledge tells you that it should work. It sort of works, but not exactly. And you begin to experiment with other ways to teach it. And that's really analysis. You're taking the, the theoretical knowledge that you've learned, you're running it through the, through the sifter of practice, 
and you're positing that perhaps, hey, you know what, maybe there's some other ways in which I could do this. And once you've gone through that analysis and have given yourself permission to find other ways to do it, you start to, uh, you start to experiment with the skill of cross-examination in a way that you haven't before. Perhaps occasionally you'll ask an open-ended question because you know that there's not an answer to that open-ended question that's going to hurt you. And because you realize that no matter which way the witness responds to the open-ended questions, you have a series of additional cross-examination questions that are going to make the point that you needed to, to make. It may be that you ask that open-ended question because you want the witness to respond in a certain fashion. You've almost baited them into that response because you know what's coming next. And you're, and you're using your assessment of the witness's personality, uh, your understanding of character or human nature, to pull the witness into a subsequent uh, line of inquiry that, that you know you're going to win. We do this all the time uh, as cross-examiners at a higher level. Now, it's not just do I occasionally use an open-ended question. That's one piece of the knowledge of uh, cross-examination that we might question. Another piece of knowledge that we might question is how are we going to ask the question? And that how are we going to ask the question might be something as simple as tone of voice. You went outside. You, you walked down the street. You were listening to your iPod. That's very different from you went outside that morning. Now, before you went outside, you grabbed your iPod. It was sitting on the counter. And you took your iPod because you like to listen to the music. What music were you listening to that morning? Whatever they say, I, re I weave it back into the cross. So you have your headphones in, you're walking down the street, you're listening to the music, and that's when the accident happened. Just the change of tone can make a difference from cross-examination purposes. Then you begin to think about not only tone, but perhaps um, internal motivations of the witness. Internal motivations that really attack bias or credibility of the witness that aren't taught per se as a cross-examination skill, but that in connection with tone can be phenomenally effective. And I, I've used the example of the snitch in other presentations. I'll use it again here. Say you're in a criminal defense situation. I've got a snitch on the stand, and I want to point out that he has a really biased and vested interest in getting out of prison. Lots of ways that I could do that. I could do the classic slash and burn that's always taught, or I could take my understanding of personality, of motivation, of, uh, of human nature, and apply it. Now, maybe I know that that snitch has pictures of his children in his jail cell. I might start the cross. So you have children, little boy 13, little girl who's nine. You haven't seen them since you went to prison. Uh, they come to visit you, but it's, it's through the glass. Uh, you haven't held your daughter in your arms in over two years. Your son is, is starting to become a man, and you're not there. You love your children. You love that boy. You'd like to take him to a ball game. Be there when he gets his driver's license. You'd like to be there to protect your daughter uh, as she uh, enters uh, the dating world. It must be terribly hard for you to be behind bars and not be with them. Now, sir, the state has offered you a deal that's going to get you out of prison earlier. And all you really have to do is to give them information that helps them in this case. That has to be an overwhelming temptation when you love your children so much. Let's talk about what you said. At this point, What's the argument that I'm making to the jury? This guy's situation, even if he's a good person, is going to make him lie because he has an overwhelming motivation. That cross-examination, rarely taught in a fu at a fundamental level, when I look at Bloom's taxonomy, you're not going to learn that in knowledge base. You're not going to learn that in comprehension. You might develop it in the application through experience. But once I begin to analyze, once I begin to synthesize my knowledge of human nature, uh, studies about psychology, my understanding of the environment uh, in, that a prisoner goes through, 
Now I can start to apply my understanding of human nature to the substantive skill of cross-examination. And I can do things from a cross-examination perspective that I could never do before. It's not because I am more loquacious. It's not because I'm suddenly more beautiful as a human being or because my voice rings with a timbre that it did not ring before. It's because I have worked my way up the pyramid of knowledge and learning. And I'm now at that point where I am synthesizing information and evaluating theories and perhaps coming up with new theories, new ways to do this. And once I reach that point where, I've, where I am truly in the synthesis and evaluation stage, I'm either going to hold on to that information like a, like a miser with a, a, a pot of gold or a, a mouse with his last piece of cheese, or I'm going to share it with almost everyone that, that I possibly can. And it's that sharing that leads us into teaching. This is what... Um, this pyramid of knowledge from Bloom's taxonomy is what makes this so effective. And, and what's interesting for us is that you are at different levels of knowledge in the pyramid of learning uh, for each and every skill or knowledge base that you have. And I can be in different places at different times, uh, and that's okay. And I may only be able to get to a certain level of learning, but when I, if I'm going to teach it, if I'm going to be able to teach it most effectively, I have to work my way all the way through that pyramid of learning so that I understand the different places where a student might reside in their understanding and application of what it is that I need to teach. And with this group, just like every time I teach this sort of information, we've got great varied skill levels at each and every uh, turn. And so I'm trying to structure the means to accomplish that. This is um, a fascinating, um, it's fascinating to be able to see the structure behind the presentation, to understand all of a sudden that perhaps what we have going on here is something truly unique, something truly interesting. It makes me, um, it makes me excited, quite frankly, to share it with you. So what do successful teachers do? Well, first of all, you have to practice what you preach. So in other words, if I'm teaching a methodology, if I'm teaching a substantive law, if I'm teaching a skill, I have to present that skill to you in the way in which I teach you the doctrine. And I've got to do it so that it reaches you, it reaches you effectively. And the best teachers uh, holistically combine the particular skill that's the application of the law, the substantive law itself, and the underlying or supporting uh, values. And those values can be societal values, they can be professional values, or they can be individual values. But that understanding of how the value system of the folks involved, the law and the application connect with one another, that's where the magic happens when we're teaching at an advanced level. Once I know this, I then am able to critique based upon this sort of analysis. So when I'm critiquing a trial advocacy uh, presentation, for example, I'm able to pull my critique in so that I'm looking at the way in which the case should have been analyzed. And I'm doing it so that I can extremely effectively uh, bring the student to the point of learning uh, as quickly as possible so that the maximum amount of time is spent on the student's development and not on the, just the presentation of the baseline of knowledge. And one of the things that I do in order to make this uh, work the best is uh, I don't let students who are performing a skill perform the skill incorrectly for a period of time and then correct them. And uh, it's, it's one of the ways in which teaching advocacy is most connected to coaching and mentoring. Uh, those of you who have learned a skill uh, that's practical in nature, whether it's uh, learning to cook, uh, throwing pots, uh, doing ceramics, playing a musical instrument, doesn't matter what the skill is, uh, the person who was teaching you, if you were doing it wrong, would not let you to continue to do it wrong so that you could establish the muscle memory of the wrong way to do it. They would instead stop you immediately and make an on-the-spot correction so that you can proceed forward with the correct 
uh, modeling the correct behavior. Uh, this is a key thing when it comes to teaching advocacy. You must make corrections in the moment. You should not allow them to do it the wrong way for an extended period of time. Uh, this is, by the way, one of the things, uh, one of the few things that the National Institute of Trial Advocacy uh, got completely wrong when they developed their methodology of teaching. Uh, this failure to make on-the-spot corrections hurts the student. It does not help the student. Uh, and I don't like it, and I would recommend that you not engage in it. And then finally, I want you to remember that everyone is always listening when you are presenting. And what do I mean by that? I mean that uh, everyone's listening to you, sort of. Got to apply the rule of threes. Uh, an old uh, Army colonel that uh, I worked with explained it to me this way. He said, Charlie, you should never be concerned about uh, doing a presentation for a group of human beings. It doesn't matter if there's three of them or 3,000 of them. He says, I can tell you a way in which you can rest completely and totally assured that two-thirds of them are going to be happy at any moment with what you're saying. I said, sir, I don't believe you. Explain it. He says, okay. He says, research has shown that human beings are mammals, and mammals uh, have a physiology that works in a certain way. This means that at any moment in time, when you're speaking to an audience, a group of people, approximately a third of them are thinking about a previous romantic encounter. Another third of them are thinking about a potential future romantic encounter. And the last third are actually paying attention to you. This means that at any moment in time, two-thirds of your audience are both happy and satisfied. And if you'll take that lesson to heart, you should never be afraid to teach someone. Uh, I think that, uh, that that's uh, kind of a cool way uh, to bring us back down to earth when it comes to how important what it is we talk about uh, really is or is not. This process, of course, uh, is connected. Uh, when I think about teaching and the structure of teaching, the identifying of the means and the modes, I'm, I'm always thinking locally about the student in the moment, uh, whether it's in a doctrinal class where I'm talking about substantive law or in a skills class where I'm assessing a performance. I'm always thinking locally, but I am focused on the outcomes. What do I mean by that? It means that I have a checklist of things that I want to make certain this student knows and takes away from the information that I presented. And if you'll look at the discussion boards that we're using in our LLM, you'll see that um, some of those uh, discussion boards are designed to get you to think about the baseline of your knowledge. And then some discussion boards later and other tasks are designed to begin you to get you to apply the knowledge to uh, establish your comprehension. And as we get further down the line in the LLM, when you uh, present your practicum, when you do your writing piece uh, based upon what choice you make uh, and your area of interest, you're going to be at the top level of that learning and that teaching where you're now synthesizing, analyzing, synthesizing, evaluating, and positing new ideas. Uh, but if I don't focus you on outcomes and then show the connections between the information that I'm teaching to you, I'm failing in my job uh, to, uh, to make this clear to you. It's one of the reasons that I'm doing this presentation on teaching now, even though we've only done a couple of blocks of instruction about uh, personality and a little bit about psychology, because I want to bring you back to center, back to the way in which these disparate doctrines that we are talking about actually connect to. Uh, your overall goal, which is increasing your ability to persuade others, and increasing your ability to teach others. And, and part and parcel of that is being able to show the connections between them. This means that feedback, feedback that is useful to the student, uh, has to be relevant uh, and it has to be ongoing. Uh, and the, the bullet that I've put up there is that you need to correct correctly. What do I mean by that? If I am going to provide feedback and suggest an alternative way of dealing with an issue, the feedback that I provide has got to actually work. Thinking about the, the levels of knowledge and, and understanding, it's got to be something that I know substantively, that I comprehend, 
why it works, and that I have then applied and know that in the application it actually performs uh, as I theoretically think that it's going to perform. Uh, this, uh, this, this ability to correct correctly creates credibility uh, and believability uh, about you in the eyes of the student, and it's very, very important uh, from the standpoint of effective teaching. And then, of course, we've got to engage the student. Uh, if the student is not engaged, if the student is not interested in what it is that we're doing, we're not going to be able to effectively bring that student over to our side. We're not going to be able to present this information in a way that's truly going to help them understand what it is that we're talking about. So this, um, this need to engage the student is paramount uh, from a teacher's perspective. And we use the means, the modalities of presentation we structure to maximize engagement. And I've talked about that uh, at other times uh, using this LLM as, as an example. Uh, let's pull this graphic out and take a look at it uh, in a large shot. Uh, if we want to create a superior learning experience for the student, we've really got to look at three things uh, in our process. We need to respect the students in the process, and as I'm sitting here looking at my slide, I realize that I've spelled process incorrectly, which is at this moment irritating the ever-loving hell out of me, but there's not anything that I can do about it. Uh, just goes to show we're all human. When we make mistakes, uh, we, just, uh, we just acknowledge them and move on. Uh, we want to respect the students and we want to respect the process of how we teach. At the same time, we want to demand excellence of the student. We don't want to set the bar so low that they're not, um, that they're not engaged in accomplishing the task. Uh, training is really only um, relevant. It's something that the student is proud of when they have actually uh, think that they've accomplished something by having survived it. Uh, students often say that I give the fairest six-hour test they've taken in three hours. I'm trying to dial it back with the LLM and, and not give you too much to think about at once. But this need to demand excellence creates validity in the information that I'm providing. And if I'm not demanding excellence, if I'm not really pushing forward uh, with these concepts, I am not respecting the student, I'm not respecting the process, and I am subliminally saying uh, to my audience that what I'm talking about just really doesn't matter. It's one of the reasons that when we present a witness, uh, we present the witness like they matter. Uh, it's why we do or do not do certain things on direct or cross-examination. Because the, the jury needs to know that this matters in the same way you need to know how much this matters. And so if I respect the students in the process and I demand excellence the right way, I'm able to constructively teach in a way that empowers the student uh, and creates that connection between myself and the student. Now looking back up at my slide where I've got process misspelled, um, you'll notice that as soon as I saw that it was misspelled, I, I went right to it and confessed up. Why? Because it's hard to hold someone accountable in a negative fashion uh, when they make a mistake, when they acknowledge the mistake and ask for forgiveness. Human nature just makes it very, very difficult to do that. Another reason is that it uh, creates credibility and believability uh, in the, in the, on the part of the folks who are listening to the person make, make a mistake. When we see one, someone make a mistake, we want them to get over it. We want to see them rise above it. That's uh, it's a very common thing from a human nature perspective. We root for the underdog. We root for the little guy. We really would like for things uh, to work out for them the right way. Uh, and so admitting when I've made a mistake, so you can see me bouncing back and forth now between cameras. I've got one here, one here, and one here. It's my day for mistakes. Admitting when I make the mistakes makes me more believable. I'm going to give you an example. I'm a young attorney. I've been practicing law for about three to four years now. I've prosecuted multiple cases, and I've done so well that I've been sent to a new jurisdiction. And in this new jurisdiction, I'm now going to be a senior criminal defense lawyer. I have three or four lawyers who work for me. Uh, I have a boss on the other side of the state. And I have my first contested trial in the new jurisdiction. First time I've appeared before the new judge. First time I've tried a case in front of this particular jury pool. 
first time I've gone up against uh, who's going to be my opponent for the next year or so. My boss comes down to watch, to assess me, so to speak. Uh, my subordinate counsel come over to the courtroom and sit in the audience to watch this, you know, new guy, you know, do his thing, whether it's good or bad, they're going to watch. My paralegals are there. I've got an entire coterie of people uh, who uh, are interested, at least nominally, in what I do. So I approach for opening statement. I tell the story of opening statement. I follow all of the doctrinal concepts of how to present a superior opening. And that doctrinal uh, presentation of opening statement is a story that sings. It is so beautiful. I've got a theme and theory of the case that's to die for. And I am just hitting it. The jury's nodding their head. They're really getting into it. I can feel opposing counsel getting upset because I'm being persuasive. I am in the moment, man. I am riding this wave, and we're going to ride this wave all the way into the beach. Or so I thought. I get to the very end, and we all, we all know what it's like when we're getting to the end of an opening statement or closing argument. We all have favorite words that we go to uh, a series of... Uh, of things that we just sort of say to wrap up. It lets us know that we're done, lets the jury know that we're done, and keys us in that we're moving on. So I'm standing there in all my glory, and I say, members of the jury, at the close of this case, I will come back to you, and I will show you how the evidence and the law prove conclusively that my client is guilty. That's right. I tell the jury that I'm gonna prove that my client, my defense client, is guilty. Now, I realize that I have said this. I don't realize that I've said it in front of the jury. I realize that when I walk back to counsel's table and my client is looking at me uh, like I have sold him down the river. And about that moment, I hear the judge, and the judge goes, um, <clears throat> Captain Rose, did I hear you correctly? Did you really just tell this jury that they will find your client guilty at the close of this trial? Now, there's a lot of things that I could have done at that point, right? I could have hung my head in shame. I could have, I could have argued with the judge that that wasn't what I meant. Uh, I could have tried. I could have asked for a recess. There's all sorts of things that I could have done. Uh, but my response, I just sort of said, Your Honor, I am so sorry. Uh, I've been prosecuting cases for years now, and this is my first case as a defense lawyer. And I was just saying what I've been saying for years when I put people in jail. Uh, I know what a case is worth, and of course, uh, at the close of this trial, I'm going to show them why my client should not be convicted. Now, I'd like to say that I set all that up so that I could tell this new jury that I was an experienced lawyer who knew what the heck that I was doing. But that is not the truth. The truth is that I just screwed it up. But I immediately confessed to the bonehead play and moved on. Fortunately, that young man was acquitted at trial. If he had not been, I'm sure it would have been a reported case for ineffective assistance of counsel, and I might not even be sitting here before you today. Who knows? Uh, but the teaching point there is, you know, when you screw it up, own it. Same thing in front of a group of students when you're teaching an advocacy skill or substantive law. If you get it wrong, hey, you got it wrong. Just say so and move on. So, when I go to teach an advocacy skill, there's some things that I am worried about. There's some things that I'm concerned with. I've got a problem. And the problem is, is that uh, am I individually credible to the students that I am teaching? Do I have the resources available to properly teach the information? And am I teaching practice or am I teaching theory or am I teaching some combination of the two? And this problem exists in every single skills course that is taught in law schools. And it exists to a lesser degree in every CLE program that deals with teaching skills. And it's, a, it's an endemic issue. And to a certain extent, law schools are victims of their own success historically. They've made a lot of money. They've gotten a lot of control of their lives using the theory-based approach to the practice of law. In other words, teaching law that's really not relevant to the practice of law. And so we as a profession, uh, and by profession I mean the teaching profession, not the practice profession, uh, have gotten away from, to a great extent, the practicality of what, what it is that we teach. 
and focus on the theory. Because in the land of theory, I can change the circumstances, and I, the law professor, will always be king, and you will always be a serf. And it's all about reflecting back my own unalterable wisdom and making you feel stupid. Uh, that's the problem with the historical approach uh, to a Langdalian theory of teaching law. It just doesn't work. Uh, it doesn't work terribly well in a doctrinal course, and it is abysmal when I am teaching skills. I need to have a student-centered education that takes the best of practice and the best of doctrine and brings them together so that the student can maximize their understanding of what has happened. And the way that I do that is by picking a process that organizes the, the information that I'm teaching, that implements the skills that I'm talking about, and that critiques them. Now, what do I mean by that? I mean that when I am teaching the substantive doctrine of how to perform a particular skill, I am using um, the concepts of that skill in the presentation of the information. For example, uh, I can't tell you how many times I have taught in a CLE environment, often for the National Institute of Trial Advocacy, but not always, and someone gets up for an hour-long block of instruction to teach the students on the effective use of exhibits at trial. And the presentation on the effective use of exhibits never has an exhibit in it. They literally stand and talk for an hour. You have to walk the walk and talk the talk. You have to mirror in your presentation the doctrines and the ideas that you are arguing are effective. Uh, and if you go back and look at what we're doing in this LLM, you will see that almost every single thing I do is designed to walk the walk and talk the talk, to put those two together. Uh, in the choice of visuals that I use, uh, in the tone of voice that I take with you, in the structure of the presentation, it is all designed to get you to buy into the idea that I know what the heck I'm talking about and that you ought to pay attention. You know, that's, that's just saying it at a baseline level, but it's an argument of persuasion that is ongoing. Uh, and, uh, and it's what we as advocates have to be able to do. So, when I think about it from the standpoint of the process, skills, and values that I mentioned earlier today, I'm really talking about how you approach critiquing a student in the moment of the advocacy skill, what you choose to critique, and why it matters. So the how is the, is the skill of teaching. It's the way in which you deal with it. The what is the substantive advocacy doctrine that you're going to focus on based upon the performance. And the value is why the student should make the change from what they were doing to what you suggest they do now. This uh, tripartite approach to teaching, coaching, mentoring can be applied to any substantive skill that you want to teach another human being. Whether it's how to cut a 90 degree angle on a board, what steps you go through when you build a guitar, how to tile the bathroom, or how to cross-examine an expert witness. It doesn't matter. These three ideas from a human learning perspective from a teaching modality are absolutely the same. Um, so when I go to teach advocacy, I need to identify the skill sets, choose the structure that I'm going to use to put them together, and I need to identify how the lecture, the performance, and the cr critique connect to one another. And if you'll think about uh, earlier in our presentation in this block of instruction, when I talked about the baseline of knowledge, that's the skill sets, Choosing the structure uh, is the comprehension and the application of that skill sets, and then bringing the lecture, the performance, and the critique together uh, is where I really begin to make the magic that makes this stuff most effective. Uh, and you have to think about it at a very deep level to be able to make it work in the moment. So if I do this right, my lecture has got both substance skills and values included in it. 
I am holistically presenting the information so that the students see the connection between the practice of law and the theory of law. It is actually a higher level of learning than just the pure uh, substantive doctrinal um, understanding of the law. It's, it's the next level up. Uh, it's, uh, it's where you go with the stuff that you learn in the first year of law school as you begin to truly apply it. And, and once I've identified the lecture so that I get all this information together, that's the delivery of stuff. I then get into the performance of the skill. And the performance might be a problem, it might be a discussion thread, it might be a demonstration, it might be a practical piece of stuff that I have the student do that I can then give feedback for. Uh, we're going to be doing this over and over again. We're going to be using our Acclaim website. You're going to be uploading your performances and I'm going to be critiquing them, providing you individual assessments, uh, telling you how you can get better, what I would suggest that you would do and how I would suggest that you would do it. Um, I am, in a very real sense, uh, going to be functioning as a life coach for you. Some of you are going to need a lot more life support than others. But I'm going to try to help each of you by watching that performance and providing feedback. And I'm going to do it by using a critique methodology that focuses on the what, the how, and the why. And that is really the core of teaching any substantive skill. It's how I critique the individual so that they're going to uh, take what I have to say in a way that's going to help them. And this what, the how, and the why is the last slide that we're going to talk about today in this block of instruction because from this point on we've now got some idea. When I say what, I'm really talking about identifying with specificity the behavior that I observed in the performance that I want to change. And in order to get the student to change the behavior, they have to acknowledge that the behavior occurred. Now when I'm in a live CLE environment and I am watching someone and I'm critiquing them after they've just performed, I've got to say, I've got to get them to believe that my description of what they did is accurate. To the extent that I can play back almost verbatim, their words, or that I can model their gesture, I'm going to get believability because they're going to have to accept that the behavior that I talked about occurred. So I won't get into an argument over whether or not the behavior occurred, although we may have an argument about how we might correct it. An argument is probably not the right word. A discussion uh, professionally about the value, potentially, of changing the approach. But the, the what is important. What is easier, quite frankly, when I videotape the performance and we're reviewing the performance after it's been videotaped. Because there's really no argument about the what. It's just identifying with specificity the piece that we want to focus on. And if you'll think about our Acclaim software platform uh, that I demonstrated for you when we did our orientation, it's going to be very easy for us to identify the what because the comments that I will make on your performances are going to be date time stamped to that moment on the tape. So it's going to be relatively easy for you to identify properly how you can go forward and change. So we got to identify the what. The next thing is the how. The how is the behavior that I want you to adopt as opposed to the behavior that I've observed you perform. And the how is a, is a modeling process. Now if we were in the room together, I would just stand up and say, when you do this, do it like this. I would model the right physical presentation. I would put my body in the right uh, set of circumstances. I would make the hand movement that I wanted you to make. I would talk about turning and looking at the jury at a certain moment. Uh, I would discuss the, the physicality of your performance, the tone of your voice, or the substance of the words. I could do all those things in the room. Uh, when we're talking distance-wise, that's going to be a little bit more problematic. Uh, what I'm going to try to do is use a claim and then provide videotapes of my suggested ways to deal with it, which means that I'm going to be performing for you just as you perform for me. And I'm doing that so that I can demonstrate the how, the how you could make yourself better. And then the last piece of it is really the why. 
And the why is in all actuality uh, the synthesis of the law, the skill, and the art to validate the behavior that I want you to adopt. And when I give the why, I am relying upon my own experiences, I'm relying upon my study, I'm relying upon the thoughts that I, the teacher, have engaged in to make myself uh, more effective. For why I want you to change to really work, I have to speak from a position of credibility as the instructor in the room. If I don't have the position of credibility as the instructor in the room, the door will be closed uh, to the explanation that I'm going to give. I establish my credibility through my actions every moment that I'm in front of the class, whether it's in front of the class digitally or otherwise. Each and everything I do is designed to increase my credibility. So when the time comes for me to say, hey guys, do it this way, you're literally thinking, well, maybe this fool might know a little bit about what he's talking about. Uh, and that's part of the process of developing yourself as both a teacher and an advocate, finding those ways uh, systemically to make yourself appear more credible organically. This structure that we've talked about in this block of instruction uh, is, um, is very helpful when we're teaching something. Now, what I want you to do is to go to our discussion uh, section uh, for this particular block of instruction. It'll be in the, uh, the discussion board. I've also put it uh, in our classroom folder. And I've given you a small assignment. I want you to come up with a way to teach something. Uh, you'll know what it is that I want you to come up with a way to teach once you go and see it. And you may be surprised. You may not. I may be surprised too because, quite frankly, I haven't quite chosen what it is I'm going to have you do yet. But I got some ideas. Take care, and I'll see you later.